This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. As the nation celebrates Memorial Day, Princeton professor Danielle Allen examines the power of words in the Declaration of Independence to bring us liberty and equality. Hillary Clinton, will she or won't she? Regular commentator Fred Rodondaro says the Democratic nomination is not hers for the asking, but it would be a big surprise if she doesn't get it. And Bill Press talks with nation's Zoe Carpenter about immigration reform and Republican politics. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Political science professor and MacArthur genius Danielle Allen has written a book about the Declaration of Independence. And she says its powerful words about liberty and equality are an example of how we, as individuals, can use words to achieve our political ends. And we say hello to Dr. Allen, a professor uh, of social science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Also a MacArthur Foundation genius and author of a new book about the Declaration of Independence called Our Declaration, a Reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. Dr. Danielle Allen, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And, you know, how would you rank the Declaration of Independence among the great documents of the Western world? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. I think it's right up there uh, at the very, very top. So I'm not one to count exact numbers, but I think it's a must read. You know, one of those desert island classics. If you had to take something with you, you could take nothing else. The declaration would be on my list. Okay. Now, your take in the book is that we usually assume that liberty is the declaration's gift to free people. But you make the point that liberty is impossible without equality. Why has equality been given such short shrift? That's a great question. So liberty and equality are the two founding concepts of democracy. They're twins. I think of them as Siamese twins, really. You have to have that egalitarian bond in a community to defend liberty in the first place for ourselves individually and for ourselves collectively as a community. In the middle of the 20th century, a lot of folks on the libertarian side of things started working really hard on the concept of liberty, digging back into philosophy, disseminating key texts, Smith, Hayek, things like that. And so I think over the last half century, this country's had a much deeper conversation about the liberty concept than we've had about the equality concept. And for that reason, I think that equality concept has fallen a bit behind. How do we, how do we balance that? How do we, how do we bring that back into balance? Well, honestly, I think a great way to start is by reading the Declaration of Independence. I mean, it's only 1,337 words, and I'm astonished by how how few people have read it from start to finish. But when you do, you realize that the equality concept is woven all the way through. So not just in the famous sentences everybody knows, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, but it's in the first sentence when the colonists declare that they're going to assume their separate and equal place on the world stage in relationship to other powers. It comes back at the end when they all declare that they're going to they're gonna, um, commit themselves to sharing their, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor with each other mutually. The idea of mutuality is an idea of equality. It comes out in the middle of the Declaration when they share with us their list of grievances, which in fact they built in a very egalitarian way. They even put ads in all the newspapers throughout the colonies asking people to share their stories about what had happened to them with the British. So all the way through there's an argument about the place of equality in building a community and in achieving decisions that are good for the whole community. And so I think you know, even starting with that text, um, it's a terrific way to re- reintroduce oneself to the philosophical content of equality. Well, again, we're speaking with uh, Professor Danielle Allen, Professor of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, and we're talking about her, her new book, Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. So how should we look at such an eloquent and revolutionary statement of equality, given that at least one of its main authors was a slaveholder? It's really important to recognize that the Declaration is the product of many voices. I think of it as a polyphonic text, 
And we give Jefferson a lot of credit. He deserves a lot of credit as a key draftsman, but he was by no means alone in that work. And so people don't realize that John Adams of Massachusetts was critical to the coming to be of the Declaration. He and Richard Henry Lee of Virginia are the people who really turned all the wheels and cogs of politics to make a declaration happen in the first place. They're the ones who got the resolution going that there should be a declaration and got a committee set up, got Jefferson elected to it and so forth. But the key thing there is that Adams was an anti-slavery person. He never held slaves. He was against slavery. He wrote an important text in, that was published in April of 1776, arguing that happiness should be the key concept around which governments organize themselves. That happiness concept, it could not be more important because what it did was displace the Virginians' property concept. The Virginians wanted and did in the Virginia Declaration of Rights use a property concept as part of a way of defending slavery. By keeping that out of the Declaration, which was surely Adams' contribution, he made sure that the Declaration itself could not count as a defense of slavery. Now, while we look back at the Declaration of Independence as a, an almost sacred text advocating equality and liberty, wasn't it really an appeal by rich white male merchants who simply wanted to get gain seats in Parliament? So again, I think that the it's a much bigger, broader text than that. I find it really astonishing, actually, that when you dig into the events that preceded the Declaration, you find towns all over the colonies holding meetings to talk about what's been happening to them with Britain. And, you know, literally towns would put up posters and say, everybody gather in Farmer Smith's Field on Sunday at 3 p.m. And then you had royal governors punishing people for, for trying to gather like that. And those gathering of townspeople brought all different kinds of people together, merchants, yes, but farmers as well. And we even have places where we can see women participating in some of these conversations. So it's a, it's a bigger, richer story than we're used to telling. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, Go ahead. Anyway. Sorry. I mean, for example, and people are used to understanding that those kinds of meetings happened in, say, Massachusetts, which had a very strong democratic town culture. But those kinds of meetings happened in Georgia as well, which people think of as sort of more oriented towards an aristocratic system. So there really were deep democratic roots operating um, as the conversations that built to the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. could, could the Revolutionary War have succeeded without those 1,377 words? <laughs> Um, I don't think it could have, actually. I mean, I think they were key on a number of levels. So they, the process of coming to decide to declare independence is the process by which, in my view, the very disparate, diverse peoples of the colonies, in fact, became one people. And that notion of being one people is in the first sentence of the Declaration. That wasn't an obvious thing. I mean, they were from different parts of Europe. They weren't all even English speakers and so forth. There was even religious diversity among them. So they had to become one people in order to win. They, that process of deciding to declare independence and writing a text together was critical to that. Of course, the text also obviously had what you know, might straightforwardly be called propagandistic purposes. They wanted to get France on their side. They had to convince France that they counted as a nation, as a state, and that is one of the fundamental purposes of the Declaration was to make that case. Um, and they succeeded, so they convinced the French at least. That made a big difference in terms of winning the revolution ultimately. Well, and, you know, and much of the Declaration reads like a count-by-count a, a count indictment of King George, but politically speaking, weren't the real villains the prime minister and parliament, or does it even make any difference now? Yeah, that's a fascinating question, um, and I think it is one of the trickiest questions. So there's a real silence about parliament in the Declaration. So when you read that list of grievances, there's even one in the middle where they describe the, the king as having combined with others. So it's a very oblique and vague phrase, but the others that they're referring to there you know, is exactly members of parliament. So why did they leave parliament out? I think there are two reasons. One because the symbol of a tyrant was a very powerful symbol for mobilizing people. So in that regard, it was a rhetorical move. But I think the other reason is that they were actually, to the best of their ability, trying to keep the British people, you know, so those who were not immediately part of the monarchy, possibly open to being on their side. In other words, I think they were trying even to sort of drive a wedge between the king and his people in England. Um, in other words, I think sowing seeds of republicanism there too. So um, it was a kind of canny strategic move, I think, to put all the focus on the king instead of throwing parliament in with him. And it, kind of a double-edged sword type of document then. It's a, it's a powerful document, absolutely. So in, in my book, I make the case, you know, yes, 
it's this incredibly important philosophic text, but it's also actually just a kind of very pragmatic political memo that's getting some work done. And one needs to see how both of those things are happening at the same time. And I suppose the other thing I think that's important about that is that to see how much they believed that words can do political work and to remember the power of language and its ability to help us make new kinds of worlds, help generate new kinds of actions. And that's a power each and every one of us has. So I really think that the, the idea of equality comes down to that core capacity we each have to use language, to shape worlds, to make judgments. And so the amazing thing about the document is that it's doing exactly the thing that it says everybody has the capacity to do. Perhaps this is a good time to point out to folks that if you haven't read it, you should go and read the, the Declaration of Independence. And even if you have, maybe it's probably a good time to go back and read it again, and, and, and maybe we can kind of set our, our own modern-day political ship straight again. Absolutely. But let me just give you a little tip when you go do that, because odds are, if you go to read the Declaration now, you're going to go log on to the page on the National Archives, and you'll get that transcription there. And you know what? There's actually an error in that National Archives transcription. So I've been trying to talk to them about this, and we'll see if I make any progress. But the important second sentence, which, which lists the self-evident truths, is a three-part sentence. So first we get the notion that all men are created equal and endowed with the rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Then we get the idea that governments are instituted in order to protect these rights. And then we get the idea that when those rights are not being protected by government, we have the right to alter and abolish in order to secure our safety and happiness. So the whole sentence of the truth moves from our individual rights of life, liberty, and happiness, pursuit of happiness, to a collective right to collectively secure our safety and happiness as a whole community. But in the transcription that you'll see on the, on the website there, there's actually a period after the first truth as if it stops at our individual rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But the sentence doesn't stop there. It goes all the way through from individual to collective to what we do together, and that's a really important part of the Declaration. I, I, f I find it astounding that, that it's, it's inaccurate there on, on that website. But, um, well, it's a long and it's a complicated story for how that happened, um, but it's the case. If you go look at all the, the manuscripts that Jefferson wrote, the manuscripts that Adams wrote, the, manu the record, manuscript record that's in the Continental Congress's official record, there's no period there. Okay. Dr. Danielle Allen, professor of social science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Her new book, Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. Dr. Allen, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Sure thing. And Thanks hope to have me. Well, we hope to have you back again soon. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Despite Benghazi, regular commentator Fred Rodondaro says Hillary Clinton's biggest attribute is that people do think she's competent. And we'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. The corporate powers that be keep thinking we'll stay hitched to their plow no matter how severely they lash us economically and kick us politically. But to borrow one of George W.'s convoluted phrases, they're badly misunderestimating America's workaday people. As the Occupy Wall Street movement demonstrated, and as shown by the ongoing actions of fast food workers and others who've been shunted into poverty wage jobs, we Americans are innately rebellious. In fact, from the Revolutionary Declaration of 1776 forward, rebellions are us. Shays' Rebellion in the 1780s, strikes by women mill workers in the early 1800s, the populist movement of the 1880s, and on into today's uprisings. We've never taken well to the moneyed powers grabbing more for themselves at our expense, and now they're grabbing more than ever. 
Wall Street elites, corporate profiteers, and inheritors of multi-billion dollar fortunes are trying to divert our attention from their oligarchic greed by spending lots of money on PR campaigns, front groups, and politicians to tell us that big government is our problem. I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. The ones knocking down the middle class and holding down the poor today are those same elites, profiteers, and heirs. The corporate media won't talk much about this reality, but a growing majority see it and is in a spreading rebellion against it, because after all, they're experiencing the abuse. This is Jim Hightower saying the great anthem by rocker Patti Smith pretty well sums up where we Americans are and where I think we're going. People have the power to dream, to rule, to wrestle the world from fools. Ordinary folks are awakening to the realization that the fools have seized power. And the folks are now making moves and movements to seize the fools by their short hairs and reclaim our dreams. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor. All for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Fred Rodondaro of the Center for American Progress assesses domestic politics, including Hillary Clinton's chances of winning the Democratic presidential nomination. And we welcome once again to our program, AmericasDemocrats.org, Fred Rodondaro, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, contributor to the Huffington Post, of course, is a regular contributor to AmericasDemocrats.org, uh, also active in the lay Catholic community, especially on social issues. As always, Fred Rodondaro, thanks very much for joining us on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you, Jim. As always, a great delight to be here. Nice to have you with us. So let's start with politics. What do you think the chances are of Democrats retaining control of the Senate this year and picking up seats in the House? I think I think both are going to happen. I would be astonished if Democrats don't retain control of the House. Uh, I even looked at someone like uh, Mitch McConnell uh, losing uh, to the Democratic candidate in in Kentucky. Uh, and I just don't see uh, Republicans being able to um, being able to pick up any seats in the House. I think Democrats uh, will pick up more seats. Uh, that, uh, Republicans will lose some seats. I don't think, sadly, that Republicans will lose control of the House. So how I wish that would happen, but I, I don't see it happening. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty big hill to climb right there. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing about Mitch McConnell that you mentioned, too, he's got a lot of pressure from within his own party to somebody who's actually, believe it or not, more conservative than he. Uh, you know, he's got the, he's got the Tea Party s- steaming down his neck, too. He really does. Mitch McConnell, I think, is a pretty bright guy. Uh, I think he's got a great belief in being the party leader. He believes in that. But frankly, uh, he's conservative, but his main... Uh, obligation is to the corporations that fund them. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a while, a month or so ago, whatever it was, at the uh, CPAC meeting, Mitch McConnell showed up on stage carrying a rifle and handing it to a retired Senator Tom Coburn. Uh, when I think, when I think a minority leader of the U.S. Senate gets that desperate and has to pull such a cheap and trite stunt appealing to the rafters, you know that he knows he's got a little bit of trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how do you see politics of the budget? With, with President Obama giving lip service to, to taxing the rich and strengthening the safety net, but at the same time leaving years of domestic spending cuts in place? Uh, I don't think that he is giving uh, lip service to taxing the rich. I think this ultimately has got to be part of his legacy. He's got to change what is happening with low-income America and with middle-income America, or uh, he's just not going to get, uh, he's just not going to have the kind of legacy he really does, does want. He's still, he's still willing to cut a deal with Republicans, but I think that willingness is, uh, is uh, fading uh, by week by week by week. 
Uh, I think he should realize by this time uh, he's not going to cut a deal with the Republicans, and he should go uh, for pretty much everything he possibly can get. Well, that's uh, even I, if he I cuts a, a deal. At, if if he cuts a deal, at what cost? Oh, I think if he cuts a deal uh, at uh, cuts a deal in the way that he was trying to do stuff in the first year or two years. Of his, of his administration, uh, his progressive base is just going to revolt and go after him. Right. There's only so much he can do. Uh, the reality is that America is at a stage where in regard to uh, the rich, the poor, the middle class, we, we are at a make or break stage where we are going to either change America in the future uh, in in, a, in ways that we simply uh, don't want to tolerate and that I think would have the progressives blow up against uh, President Obama. We're speaking with Fred Rodondaro, senior fellow at the Center for American uh, Progress, contributor to the Huffington Post, as well as americasdemocrats.org, of course. Uh, you, you mentioned changing the country. Is immigration reform dead for the foreseeable future? I think it pretty much is. Very, very sadly, uh, this uh, John Boehner has uh, stuck his neck out on one or two clauses. I just don't see him going for very much uh, beyond that. And uh, I think that President Obama is going to uh, is going to do as much as he can, uh, as he said he would, with executive orders. But I don't really see any major. Uh, I don't really see any major immigration changes coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should point out that my uh, one-time boss. Us, as you as you pointed out, I'm a senior fellow at the center, and uh, John Podesta started the center. John was uh, President Clinton's last chief of staff, but in the last couple of years of the Clinton regime, uh, John, especially as chief of staff, was figuring out how to get things done when you were dealing with a Congress that was just nigh onto impossible and that objected to your every move. And I think that Podesta, who is the constitutional lawyer, is going to be over at the uh, is going to be over at the White House. He's cut all connection with the Center for American Progress. But I think Connect, uh, Podesta, uh, who's a very smart, wily guy, is over there looking to see how we can get this stuff done by going around or, if need be, through uh, through Congress. Mm-hmm. You know, there has been a sea change in American politics regarding same-sex marriage and marijuana legis- yeah. or legalization. Are those things that signal a resurgence of progressive values, or are they just the reality of you know, many conservatives smoking pot and being gay? Oh, I, I, I think it's the latter. I, I really do. I think uh, America is simply becoming so much more pluralistic, uh, particularly uh, with, uh, with, with uh, young, young people. Uh, I, I look at my kids. Uh, my kids are 30, 32 now and 35. Uh, and their friends are such a wide, crazy uh, mixture of people, and they don't judge other young people on whether they're gay. Uh, they 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 might ju- they judge them sometimes. My kids do at least on whether they smoke cigarettes, because they say if you smoke cigarettes, you you try to make a statement. And boy, don't you know these things are going to kill you in the long run? They just look upon that as being stupid. Right. But if you're gay. Uh, if you smoke a little pot, I don't think it matters to these young people. And that's permeating up through society and, and with, the, uh, with parents. Mm-hmm. Again, we're speaking with Fred Rodondaro, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. Um, looking far ahead into 2016, although it's, it's, it's funny because it seems like it's right around the corner, uh, do you think Hillary Clinton has the Democratic nomination for the asking? No. No, I do not. I do think I would be very surprised if she doesn't get it. Uh, it's, you know, Democrats are going to be like the Republicans this time around. It's uh, a feeling that it's her turn. Uh, she has so much support so, uh, at all levels of the party. I, I would be amazed if she doesn't get it. The only, the only way I can see her not getting it is if she runs uh, a similar campaign, and by similar I mean uh, the 2012 campaign, excuse me, 2008 campaign for Hillary Clinton was not particularly uh, uh, well executed or well thought out. But I just don't see that happening. 
And I don't see anybody on the left who is going to challenge her. Elizabeth Warren could, although she said she will not. Uh, people like Martin O'Malley, Andrew Cuomo, uh, a couple of others might would probably want to jump in, as, of course, would, uh, uh, would Vice President Biden. Mm-hmm. But I do think that it's Hillary's to lose at this stage of the game. What about John Kerry? Oh, I don't see John Kerry coming back. He is right now, I think he's 68. I could be wrong. But John Kerry would be 72. Uh, Joe Biden would be 74. Hillary is going to be 68 in uh, 2016. I think uh, being Secretary of State, this, this is the ultimate for John Kerry. I think he's handling it very, very well. I don't see him trying to make a, a return running for, running for president. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's go back to Hillary. If, if she is going to run on her accomplishments, there aren't that many as Secretary of State, are there? I mean, and they're really— That's true. And, and, and there are you know, negatives like Benghazi and the reset with Russia— um mm-hmm. there there's already some baggage building up and that's more recent stuff from from her more recent role as uh as secretary, secretary of, state. of state so yeah i i think benghazi has pretty well run its course um uh representative daryl uh, isa of the house operations committee uh at a fundraiser in california for his own people uh was caught on camera saying that Hillary Clinton gave the order to stand down uh, to the American military when Benghazi, in Benghazi when the uh, consulate, consulate was being attacked. He was called out for it because it's so blatantly a lie by Fox News, of all places. Uh, Benghazi, I think, will have run its course. It's it's uh, uh, it's it's a rallying cry uh, for Republicans uh, because it's simple. Uh, it plays to the theme uh, that Hillary and the president uh, are really outsiders who don't have loyalty to the country. But it's such a lie. It is such an incredible lie that will that will really go nowhere. I think Hillary's biggest attribute, and this is going to be strange, is that people think she's competent. Uh, which she is, and people think she's tough, which I think a lot of folks like. Uh, last year, White Kathy and I were at a party in uh, in Maine where we try to get up a couple of weeks every summer at least, and we were talking to three men we know, uh, all retired, all businessmen, all solid Republicans, and each and every one of them attacked Obama, attacked President Obama, but said we could vote for Hillary Clinton for president. And what they were saying was, she's tough. We need an authoritative leader. And I, I think uh, Hillary would uh, do very, very well in the general election. I just don't. I see, her, I see her as a nominee. I see her as a solid, solid winner in 2016. You also think about her, her experience for, on so many different levels. She's been a spouse. Oh, yeah. She's been a spouse in the White House. She's been a senator. I mean, she, you know, she's been all over the place, and she's she has she, been all over the place. And you get, I saw somewhere, I forget where, but uh, uh, Republicans, uh, John McCain and Lindsey Graham, no big fans of the Democrats, were both several years ago uh, praising Hillary Clinton. Uh, they served together. I think it was on the Armed Services Committee. Apparently got along very, very well. And John McCain, who's as big a hawk as you really don't want to find any place, uh, apparently likes her, has praised her publicly in the past. Uh, she has the virtue of appearing strong. Uh, and this is a virtue that Republicans like. They like these let me go ahead and make a decision kind of leader. And uh, Hillary comes across very, very well that way. Okay. Well, we are uh, out of time for this one, Fred. But, of course, we will certainly have you back here on AmericasDemocrats.org. Uh, but, but, as always, we appreciate your time today and look forward to doing it again soon. Thanks, Jim. I, I, I look forward to it myself. Thank you. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. 
Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press and his guest, Zoe Carpenter of The Nation magazine. Zoe Carpenter is uh, covers the Washington scene for The Nation magazine, thenation.com. Joining us on our news line this morning. Zoe, good morning. Good morning. Always good to have you with us. Thank you. Um, there seem to be conflicting signals from House Republicans on immigration reform. I mean... Uh, John Boehner sort of indicated, yeah, maybe we need to move ahead with a vote. And then Eric Cantor says, no way, no how. Right. Is that how you read it? Um, Yeah, I do read it as very conflicting signals. We've heard for months now that leadership wants immigration reform to happen, that they you know that they think that there is perhaps a narrowing window in which it can happen. Um, And yet there has been very little action, and when there has been opportunity for action, they have missed it. So the example this week would be an amendment to the defense policy bill, which would have allowed undocumented immigrants to join the military and then in some certain circumstances obtain legal um, status. Right. And, 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 you know, that's – if we're considering the Republican base, that should be a pretty uncontroversial bill when it comes to immigration. It encourages – support for the military. Um, it affects a very small number of people who are brought here as children. However, b- because it does have a path <laughs> to legal status, it was objectionable. Uh, and John, didn't is, isn't that the one that Boehner came out and said he thought was a good idea? Well, Boehner says that um, what he said this week was that it was inappropriate to uh, oh. pass immigration measures par- as part of the defense policy bill. Oh, I... He left open the possibility that it could be considered later, but, you know, we all know how that goes. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then Eric Cantor refused to allow debate on, on that measure, which m- makes it look like even though some people said, well, get the Republican primaries behind us, we don't have to worry about the Tea Party challengers anymore, and then we'll be ready to move with immigration reform. It looks like that was just wishful thinking. I think so. And when you look at the polling, I don't know that there's much to fear from the, from the base on immigration. Sixty-four percent of Republicans in a recent poll said that they supported comprehensive immigration reform. So it seems like the political constraints that um, Boehner and Cantor are bowing to are really of their own making. They're, they're capitulating to a small slice of the hard right, which is very vocal and has become very powerful. But it's it's very powerful in part because the leadership continues to capitulate to it. A lot of uh, Republican primaries uh, around the country this week, um, some very, very important ones. The, uh, the general thinking, uh, and at least most people in the media are reporting, big defeat for the Tea Party, big win for the GOP establishment, which means trouble for Democrats. How do you read it? Well, I think we really have to ask what the distinctions between Tea Party and establishment are now. I think uh, the primaries show that the distinctions have largely become um, something of polish, of marketability, of funding, um, and not so much of substance or of policy. Basically, what's happening is that the establishment has been able to win by becoming more conservative, but selling themselves as being less prone to gas. Um, so, you know, they're showing up at the same party in better suits, basically. So, really... <laughs> You could see that as the, as the Tea Party winning because they have been able to push the whole party so far to the right and really get voters to vote around a very small slice of issues and for a very narrow range of um, options, really. Right. So that uh, Mitch McConnell may agree with Matt Bevin on most issues, but he just doesn't show up at a cockfighting rally. Is that kind of... <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. And you, you, when you hear Mitch McConnell um, railing against the Washington establishment as, you know, as a central uh, part yeah. of his campaign, he is the Washington establishment. Of course. Of course. No, it's so phony. I mean, it, it really it, it really is. Um, and and now the, the question, I guess, is will some of these Tea Party people, not if not that they have that much clout, but they do have some following, the, the the Tea Party candidates who were defeated, are they now going to back these so-called establishment candidates? Um, I think we'll see a, a sort of a patchwork happening. There there are some funders and some, um, you know, conservative 
personalities, pundits, who were behind Tea Partiers and who have said that they would support um, the establishment candidates who have well, won. I think more interesting is the fact that the big money donors are more willing to get into races now yeah. where the, the so-called establishment candidates have won. Sure. Well, you know, one thing that unites them all is that they all hate President Obama, right? So in the end, <laughs> in, in the end, that'll bring them all together. Hey, Zoe, always good to visit with you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Zoe Carpenter with The Nation, thenation.com. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Danielle Allen, Fred Rodondaro, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate.